All right, everyone. Thank you for coming to this last session of this conference. And I must say, I had a great conference so far, so full of information and fun stuff. And uh, also, it's, I think it's really cool that this is recorded so that other people can watch it later and, and learn from it. And it made me think of my 10-year-old daughter. She had a friend over uh, the other day, and they were playing in the garden with uh, some old camera they found somewhere. And when they came back and I asked, oh, were you playing photographers? And said, no, we were playing super successful YouTubers. So I will see if this talk earns me that title or if I'll have to work on it. So, okay, um, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Frederick. If you didn't see that in the description or on this uh, slide here, I work as a software architect for a company called Tunstall, which works within the sphere of uh, social care for elderly people. And today, uh, I <coughs> first, this uh, session is titled There and Back Again, how Tunstall created an IoT platform based on Mesos. And when I was practicing this speech, uh, I, it just struck me that There and Back Again, it kind of sounds like we were doing this Mesos streaming application all the new stuff, and then we were saying, ah, let's go back and do it the old-fashioned way, on-prem, monolith, all that. But no, what I want to describe with this talk is that we made a journey, and I wanted to share with you some of the insights we would made while doing that journey. So today I'm going to talk about the background, why we're doing this, the business foundation to it. I will just briefly touch on it, but uh, I think it's important to put things in context. And we're going to look at our new platform, which we call Evity. And we're going to do that from first a functional perspective, and then we're going to do it from a more technical perspective. And I will uh, talk about this platform and how we view it as an operating system for the uh, uh, business applications that we're going to run. After that, we're going to uh, take a closer look at one of the frameworks that we supply with this platform the IoT framework, and um, we use the term framework internally to describe a set of services and applications that we logically define together, that we deploy together, and that are dependent on each other. And that is not a Mesos framework. They could be implemented as Mesos framework, but they're not, not at the moment at least. And after the look at the IoT framework, we're going to just touch on some things that we found during this journey, technical things that I uh, would like to share with you, things that we thought were important, things that you, look, you need to get uh, a better look at. I won't be uh, going super deep into the technology about it, but I will rather just mention it to you so that if you're going to make a platform like this or something similar, you would have some um, knowledge of what to look at next. Okay, uh, during these uh, sections, uh, I will ask for questions after each section. So if you have questions uh, about something we talked about there, and we can also have a Q and A when uh, when everything is over. Okay, good. So, Tanstall, Tanstall is a company that works with social care for elderly people. We work with independent living, and we work with assisted living, and Assisted living is where elderly people live together in a facility uh, that is created for elderly to live in with staff and other things that uh, help them go on about their business. Independent living is where elderly people live in their own home, but they have some services provided by some, some private actor on the market or by the, the government. And this market is, win is changing right now. And basically, we have several factors that work together to create this change, and one of them is demographic. Currently, there is an increase uh, of in the elderly population. People are living longer, and we have a different ratio between working people and people that are considered elderly and need uh, uh, to have social care and, and thus such services. And this also makes this change in ratio between working population and aging population also um, uh, creates a, a difference in the funding. There's not so many people around to pay for the services for the elderly. And with regards to funding, we are 
seeing the trend that the funds that are allocated to the care of elderly are decreasing rather than increasing. And I'm sure that if you go home and you ask your local politician if they want to uh, increase the taxes in order to, uh, to increase the funding for this, they would probably say no, that is not so popular. But on the other hand, we also have a shift in technology that would allow us to use this new technology, sensor technology and machine learning, for instance, to provide services that are more efficient and cheaper to uh, give the same results as we have with our traditional technology. We also see that we have a new set of competitors on the market when it comes to the new types of services that we are looking at. And these competitors are not our traditional hardware-based competitors, but they're new um, uh, companies that have worked with digital transformations for a while. We have mobile operators are turning into this sector. And we also have the big ones like Apple and uh, Google. And we also see there's a slight uh, shift in the consumer market. People are willing to pay for services if they have the, the private funds to do so. And we also see a more interest in personal applications and, and, and um, um, relatives that want to have services and applications in relation to their, their elderly relatives. We think that within the next three years, 60% of our business will be in uh, new markets and or new products. And with new markets, I mean new market, I don't mean geographical new markets. Right, do we have any questions regarding this? Oh, okay, thank you. Let's go on then. So, what we did at Tanstall was that about a year and a half ago, we sat down and thought about this trends we saw and what we could do about it. And we decided that we needed to create a platform that would act as a technology enabler for new services and applications that helped us transition into this new market economy. And we call this platform Evity. And Evity is from the business perspective, uh, a platform that enables us to create new types of services and uh, use new modern technology uh, to sort of um, develop and improve the quality of our, our offerings to our customers. The services that we are trying to, to create are based on care and health services, on planning services, and on security services. So security, for instance, that is um, video surveillance, we have staff security, and we have keyless access. There are some examples. We also need to have a platform that uh, enables us to monitor what is happening within our system, to, to look at logs, for instance, or to have metrics about our, um, our devices that we have out there. Uh, we're trying to create new devices uh, to collect health telemetry, but also to integrate third-party um, devices that will supply us with the tel telemetry that we need to have these uh, preemptive and reactive services. So that was what I had to say about the how, uh, uh, why, why we're doing this. Are there any questions about it? Okay, so let's look at Evity from an architectural position. So when we started this, I started to think about the platform as an operating system. So what is an operating system? When we use our computers that we use daily, they enable us to use all this hardware that is underneath without really thinking about the technical details about them. They transform the technology into functionality. The classic example would be um, using files, for instance. When we program something that uses a file, we can tell the operating system to supply the content of a file without really needing to think about where is this file? Is this on a hard drive? Is it on a network drive? And, and 
all that um, technology that's happening beneath is transparent to us. The operating system takes care of that. For Tunstall, if we take something like a keyless lock, we have a lot of products that supply this to us. Our own products, but also third-party products. And from what I would like to this platform to do is to create the functionality that is associated with the keyless lock. And have the business application that uses this functionality can use the functionality without having to care which lock is actually uh, supplying the, the keyless functionality in the end. So if we have a planning applications, uh, a planning application uh, in which different staff teams will have access to different locks, that application would be able to run for a lot of different customers, regardless of which type of lock they use or whether the application itself uh, supplies functionality for that type of lock. And what we use is we use the, uh, the old pattern of plug and play. So within this operating system, we want to be able to allow uh, services and applications to run by plug and play. So we will off usually we will provide a framework and the services can then either plug in new functionality into this framework or they can reuse the framework for their own purposes. And the frameworks that we are going to, to deliver with as part of the core, frame, core platform is uh, the IoT framework, identity frameworks, we have uh, data warehouse, for instance. We also have a framework for hybrid cloud. Uh, we do think a lot about data integrity and security uh, for our applications and our data. And although we say that our new platform should be uh, based in the cloud, we do know that in certain scenarios our customers will require us to uh, allow them to run certain parts of the application either on-premise or maybe in a data center that is located within the country of uh, that the same country as the customer. So we want to have um, a framework that allows us to run the same set of applications but in different uh, alongside each other in different locations. And the hybrid claim cloud framework does that for us. If we look at the architecture of the platform, we it's basically layered in three layers. And as we see, we use Mesos and DCOS to power all three of them. And the platform layer or the operating system kernel if you want to call it that. If we look at an operating system, I, I never mentioned it before, but uh, we said that it provides functions or it translates technology into functions, but it also allows us to run, uh, ha have a runtime environment for us to run our application. That's also important in this platform that we have that. And also in, in the third part of the operating system is to, to um, provide uh, some common functionality that we can use, and that are our frameworks. And in the platform layer, we use uh, an IoT hub, uh, we use event messaging systems, and um, authorization and access control, for instance. That's part of our framework. And on top of that, we can then implement our own uh, customized applications and services, and uh, we use DCOS as the runtime for them, so we can scale them and deploy them easily and also upgrade them. And we, we want to have an environment in which each, each application can run on this platform and each application can then have their dedicated team that uh, implements them and have their own life cycle. And we often let the team uh, by themselves decide how what technology to use to implement it. So we don't say that this is, for instance, only Java. An application could be implemented anything. We are technology stack agnostic. As long as the application can run in a container, we're happy. Then we can run it on DCOS. And then on top, we have uh, access management. And we have a uh, protocol gateway, which, which is associated to the IoT hub. We have an API gateway to, to uh, route any incoming traffic to the correct end service in the backend. And we also have authentication services for the uh, um, 
for the APIs and the protocol gateway. Any questions about this architecture? Okay, so let's take a look at the IoT framework. So this was one of the first frameworks we decided to do, and this was maybe this was the the, the driver that made us that made us do this platform from the beginning. We wanted to create an environment in, in which we could read tel health telemetry data, and we wanted to be able to read health telemetry data from a lot of different sources. Uh <coughs> And the only thing we knew from the outset was that we don't know which um, which devices we're going to use in the future. We only knew that there would be devices. Some of them would be our own. Some of them would be third party. We didn't know which which metrics we would uh, going to be interested in. We knew some, of course, but still today I know that we are in the future are going to collect metrics that I don't know today which ones. So the IoT sensor data architecture is architected so that we we can have a set of or a framework with a set of services that act upon this data that we don't really know today what it is, but still um, uh, give us functionality to have a real rapid development with um, uh, IoT sensors. So. Um, what we do is for each metric that we we are interested in in collecting, we try to normalize it so that regardless of the source, we can have a unified way of looking at that metric for a specific person. We also want to have a situation in which we can plug in new devices easily and rapidly without redoing a lot of work and without having to redeploy a new system or or anything like that. We um, we also want to to use um, stream and stream analytics on these metrics, and um, the IoT sensor data architecture looks like this. So basically, we have divided it into three parts. First, we have something that we call the payload pipeline, which is the top four boxes. And then we have the metric extraction service, and then we have the telemetry services. And the first part, the payload pipeline, it looks upon device data that comes into the framework um, as a payload that it doesn't know anything about. So it's just a, a, a set of bytes, basically. And it l acts upon the metadata that is associated with the payload. And from that, it will transform or uh, or reroute the messages to various other services that are interested in the in the pipeline. So we can actually hook up a new um, device uh, to this system, and it will function without us having to do any form of re implementation or uh, any changes in the existing architecture. In the end. When everything has been filtered and, and rerouted, it will hit the metric extraction service. And this architecture is, use, is actually using a revamped old uh, architectural style. I don't know if you realized which one it was. Um, we reused the, uh, the old pipes and filters which was uh, invented in ba Bell Laboratories somewhere in the mid 60s when they were uh, implementing the Unix operating system. I, I think it's kind of, it, it, it's, it's really a, a property of a sound architecture that you can still reuse this architecture so long after it was, was created in a completely new context. And I also think it's quite fitting that in a platform that calls itself an operating system that we reuse this classic old architecture for one of the most iconic operating systems ever. Uh, but let's get back to this. So 
what happens here is that the the uh, the payload will hit the metric extraction service. And if we say that the payload pipeline does not know anything about the payload, the metric extraction service knows everything about the payload. So the metric extraction service is the service that is responsible for extracting the metrics from the payload that comes in. And then obviously we will have a lot of different metric extraction services. We will have one for each combination of device and firmware that is running out there, if the different firmwares uh, have the consequence of the device having a different payload. And the, the metric extraction service will then extract the metric that is interesting or, or that is uh, sent by the device, if that's one or if that's many different metrics, and then publish that to the metric service which is then normalized format, which meaning that we can reuse the metric from a lot of different devices. And uh, then each metric, we will have one service for each metric that we're interested in. And how we store and, and uh, make that data available to client applications is uh, very much up to each metric that we're going to use. So whether or not that's going to be on a, uh, on a stream for stream analytics or if it's going to a machine learning uh, scenario or if it's just going to be stored to have static reports, we will use different scenarios for that. And this gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of what we are able to accomplish with new different devices. So in the classic scenario, what we're having here is a one-to-one -one relationship between device and metric extraction service. So if we have one device running one uh, uh, version of the firmware, we would have one extraction service for that. But we have the flexibility to change that because we, we don't necessarily need to have one, met one service for that specific uh, device. We could have several services for the same device, if that makes sense. If there was a very complex um, payload with a lot of metrics, we could have one service for each metric. On the other hand, if we have a, a device that sends us a payload that is different between firmware versions, but not so much, it might make a lot of sense to have the same service uh, extract the metrics from both of those. So we have this flexibility. And uh, as, I, as an architect, I always come back to the flexibility part of the architecture. And, uh, and I would like to share a story with you. I was um, driving in my car uh, some time back, and I had radio on. And on the radio, there was a science show, and they were interviewing a professor from a university in the US. And he was talking about uh, something that he did with his research team. They were trying to research if they could uh, um, if they could explain intelligence as a physical force that affects the world, much the same as you would, you would try to describe gravity or velocity. And in the end, they had come up with an equation or a formula that they thought described the impact of intelligence as a physical force on the world. And it was quite a long show, and the interview was quite deep, and they talked a lot about how they did this research, what they needed to do in order to do this. And at some point, he said that the first thing they had to do was to define what is intelligence, what was intelligence for them. And it was a very highly academic discussion, but then after a while, he said something that really made me look up. Look up. And he said, uh, we define intelligence as the ability to make the choices that maximizes your flexibility in an unknown future. And I was there and I was thinking, hey, wait, that's what I'm doing each and every day. And if you look at this architecture of that view, I think that is precisely what we tried to accomplish with this one, to maximize our flexibility in an unknown future. All right. Questions so far? OK, I'll have one question. So where is that demo that was promised in the description? Oh, well, 
when I wrote that description, we were on a roadmap that would allow us to be finished with one of our own devices and the uh, metric extraction for that. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. So the, some week ago, I was in the, uh, uh, I had a choice of maybe just running a lot of services on DCOS and showing that to you, but I didn't think that would make a lot of sense. So no demo, sorry for that. Okay, so final section, some uh, lessons learned while using Mesos on Windows Azure specifically. All right, to build a future-proof infra infrastructure, um, you need to uh, take a deep look into what you get when you install um, DCOS on, one on Windows Azure, for instance. I think the same questions need to be asked if you're going to run this on Amazon Web Services, for instance. But on Azure, you would basically have three options. You could use the default templates that you get from uh, Mesosphere or from the Azure Container Services, if you use DCOS as the, what they call container orchestration. Uh, you could use the Azure Container Service Engine. Do you know what that is? Do you have any experience with that? The ACS Engine? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll talk a bit about that then, later on. What you also could do is you could create your own templates um, for um, creating DCOS on, on Azure. That's the road we took at Tunstall, but that's basically, basically because we missed the uh, ACS engine. So the ACS engine is an application, it's open source, you can find it on GitHub, and you download a Docker image and run uh, locally, and that is the ACS engine is actually what Microsoft uses themselves to create the uh, templates that you use when you install DCOS on Windows Azure. So what you can do is you can, can um, do a lot of reconfiguration of how the end uh, product will look when you install DCOS. So for instance, uh, when you install DCOS on Azure, you will get everything you need. So you will get a uh, virtual network, you will get load balancers, you will get all the computers with all the hardware that is associated with them. But if you want to have more fine-grained control over that, you might want to install DCOS on an existing virtual network on Azure, or you maybe want to use something like managed disks rather than the classical disk. Then you need to either do your templates yourself or configure them using the ACS engine. So if you're going to run DCOS on Azure, I strongly suggest that you take a deep look at the ACS engine, all right? Uh, I wish we had, but now we have a set of uh, own templates that we use. And I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's quite important to have this control. I mean, if you're in a scenario where you know that, okay, we're going to install DCOS, it's just for prototyping or to get a view of it, fine, then use the default template. Or if you know that, okay, we're going to use this, we're going to install Kafka and Spark and run and that's it, then you're probably fine too, just using the def default template. But if you're in a situation where you want to um, uh, integrate uh, your application, your, your you have a lot of legacy applications that you want to integrate with the running DCS, DCOS cluster, and you know that you can't uh, you can't containerize your legacy applications. Uh, at Tunstall, we have a lot of uh, legacy applications that are running .NET code, .NET 4.6, .NET 4.5, for instance, and we can't put those on, on Linux containers. And yet we want to, in certain instances, have them in the cloud so that we can have a communication between the uh, Mesos cluster and the legacy code. And in order to do that, we need to have more control over the virtual network. And that is the first reasons why we choose to make our own templates. Um, also, if you want to have um, a different set of um, nodes in your, uh, in your cluster, it, it's important that you, you have a good grasp of how to create new um, new functionality using the template. So for instance, I think that uh, in the future we will see a lot of role-based uh, Mesos clusters. 
I don't know, uh, are you familiar with the role concepts within Mesos? Or should I just mention it briefly? Yeah, I think I'll mention it then. Uh, so a role in Mesos, when you deploy, deploy a Mesos framework or a Mesos service, you can say that this service will de only be deployed to nodes that have a specific role. And previously, there was not so good in Mesos because a framework such as Marathon could only handle one role um, uh, at a time. So, w with an exception. There's something called a default role, and that is any node that is in your cluster does that does not have a specific role attached to it um, is can be handled, and then another one. But with uh, the new release of Mesos, which I think is uh, also in DCOS 1.10, you can have several roles attached to a framework. So before, you could not have more than one role uh, except the default role in, in, in Marathon, for instance. And if you install DCOS, you already have that role. It's called public slave. And it's the role that allows you to put certain applications on the part of your cluster that is accessible from the load balancer from the outside. And uh, if you want to have another set, another role, you can't reuse Marathon for that, or you couldn't before, but you can now. And I think that will uh, make roles more used within the clusters. For instance, if you have certain applications that require a lot of memory, you could want to have a specific set of servers or, or Mesos nodes that you know have the capacity to run this service because they provide a lot of memory. And at the same time, then you don't want Marathon to um, to put a lot of other services on those nodes because you want to use them exclusively for those services that require a lot of uh, memory. And that is uh, a typical case when you use a role. So you would attach a specific role to those nodes and then when you um, deploy your applications, you add that, say that these applications should be uh, deployed on these nodes. Also with the uh, uh, Mesos for Windows coming, uh, I think there are a good share of the DCOS users that is going to uh, want to deploy uh, Windows containers on, on Windows nodes. And then, of course, you need to tell Marathon that uh, a specific application could only be run on Windows nodes. I don't know if there's some, maybe some other uh, ideas on how to solve that. Maybe the, they will build in uh, some kind of OS type into the Mesos resource offering. Uh, I'm not sure, but if, if you look at the, um, um, and there's a, uh, in the um, North American MesosCon, Mesos -Con, there was a talk about uh, Mesos for Windows, and they use uh, attributes, which is kind of a uh, very similar to roles, um, to have Marathon uh, add Windows containers exclusively to Windows nodes. And when roles are getting more usable in terms of Mesos, I think it's more. Uh, I think this is is. Um, getting important that you can actually provide new set of nodes with specific capacity to your uh, Mesos cluster. And then you need some form of um, insight into how this works, rather than just using the default templates. What I also would like to mention is that uh, we think that when you start using DCOS for the first time, you get a lot of new functionality and there are certain things that uh, at least we had to uh, invest a, a lot of time to understand how they work. So uh, get to know your new friends. You will have Marathon. Get to know that. That is uh, my advice to you. Uh, it could use some fine tuning. There's a very good API for Marathon, a REST API which you can use. It has a uh, and a monitoring endpoint, for instance, which you could hook up to your to if you're running some kind of uh, monitoring software in the backend, you could hook that up so you can extract these metrics from Marathon. 
and make choices of, of, uh, of how to scale a marathon based on that. Uh, you could, you, you might also, based on that, want to change some uh, JVM parameters, uh, Java parameters on Marathon. Uh, you can also use the Marathon API to do um, automation and deployments. We use uh, VSTS uh, at Tunstall, and we we can have a, a continuous deployment pipeline based on this API. Uh, if you're running this, sooner or later you're going to want to run your own private container registry. So try as early as possible to look up how to do that within the DCOs cluster. Um, the important thing here is to provide the, uh, the authentication information to Mesos so it can download um, from your private registry. And uh, what you can do is you can, uh, when you do a, a service, in DCOS and Marathon, you can apply something called an artifact URL, which will be downloaded. And a good thing to know is that that will use curl on that URL that you provide. So anything that curl can handle, you can put in there. We, for instance, put an FTP server on the virtual network, and we just use the FTP link uh, for, um, for DCOS to download the uh, container register information. Next tip, if you're um, relying heavily on uh, user interfaces that use backend services in uh, your Mesos cluster, you must get to know your little load balancer, the Marathon LB. Uh, especially look in how to uh, provide SSL offloading, if you're interested in doing that, which I think you are. Um, there's a lot of different options for doing that. Uh, you can provide your certificates uh, as part of your deployment of uh, Marathon LB, which is good to know. There are certain um, environment variables that you can use for doing that, so check that out. There's a lot of information on the Marathon LB and, uh, and, and uh, pages on GitHub, so check that out. And also, if you're, uh, as we are, uh, relying on um, legacy applications running on the same virtual network, in order for them to access your DCOS cluster, you will need internal load balancing. And that would work the same way as the external load balancing. That is, you would use um, Marathon LB, but you would use them uh, at internally on the virtual network and with the load balancer that's also internal for the network. Okay, that was it. Thank you very much. I will um, I will uh, be around here a few minutes if you want to ask some questions or just come up and say hi. Um, hi, thanks for the presentation. You're so welcome. What kind of data do you gather uh, that you will go that you are going to insert in the in in the application itself? Well, that's a good... Thanks for the question. It will allow me to uh, elaborate a bit on that. So we're primarily looking at health monitor data. So that would be things like heartbeats, there are sleep patterns you can do, movements. We want to use um, this data to have preventive services such as um, fall detection or to see if someone is active in the room, if they're going to up uh, come up out of the bed at a some certain point of time. Uh, but it's also interesting because this is what we thought when we uh, uh, designed the system. But uh, just a couple of months ago, um, we uh, was asked if we could also provide reports for the usage of um, alarm routing. You see, uh, we do have a lot of, in the um, uh, assisted living scenarios, we have a lot of alarm servers that when someone pushes an alarm button, they reroute it to the correct staff member, which is configured based on time and, and uh, such things, if they are working or not. And we were asked if we could use the IoT Hub to collect this telemetry data and provide reports. And 
the answer was simple. Yes, of course, we can. We don't, we don't care so much about the telemetry that comes in. So, so that is one of the, that is why I was glad I made it so flexible as I did. Okay, so basically patients w uh, are going to wear for the most of the time gadgets on their body that should report their state health and... Ah, uh, yeah. There's a lot of different types of gadgets. This is a classic one, something you wear. It could be one that we provide which has an alarm button but also collects these metrics like heartbeats and steps. But it could be a third party like a Fitbit or something. Uh, but there are also other kinds of sensors. There are sens room sensors that senses uh, where we are in a room, for instance. And they can be used if you, you fall, and there's a fall detection. You can also see where you, where we are when you fall, so that the staff knows where to go to find you when you fall. There's also things that are up on the roof, which is called, a, uh, like the whole ceiling is one big sensor, which is also used for uh, doing this kind of... Uh, uh, in-room placement. Uh, is any kind of system uh, that you describe already implemented or is something innovative in the in the field? Nothing is in the field as uh, as of yet, no. This is ongoing and we are planning to go live early Q1 next year. Okay. Good luck. Sounds Sounds very useful. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you.